Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Uh, good, very early morning to, to at least one of our speakers, Mike from the West Coast. Um, my name is Brett Smith. I'm at the Center for Automotive Research, and this is the third and, and final in the series of Industry, we Industry X webinars. Uh, we've done two already on, on, on people and on technology. And today we have the third of the group, uh, the strategy and process. I will make some short opening remarks, um, followed by um, some remarks from our speakers, Michael Gurr, Managing Director of Manufacturing and Automotive from Cloudera, and Brian Irwin, Automotive and Industrial Leader, Accenture. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. And then after that, we, we will um, highlight some of the lessons learned, the things that our research group at CAR found over the last several months as we've been working on this subject, Industry X, with the industry and with the tech, tech groups. So with, with that, let me step into a few moments of presentation. Um, as I've done the first two in this series, I want to start by talking about the team, the um, research ecosystem that we built to, to begin this. As we began this, and Mike and, and Brian and others were very involved in, in looking at this from the beginning, um, we, we felt it was important to grab diverse and important participants in this. The hardware, the data management, the digital solutions, consulting, and cloud infrastructure, that, that whole kind of pathway down through the process. And with the support of Intel, Dell, Cloudera, Rockwell, PTC, Accenture, and Microsoft Azure, the CAR team started on a, on a journey that, that had many bumps and many great learning opportunities and, and oh, by the way, a pandemic in the middle of it. So um, a great project, really important that, that we looked at this, we think, from an ecosystem. And I want to come back to that ecosystem discussion actually a, a lot today, Mike, Mike and um, Brian. But um, before I do that, before I go there, I want to make sure that I, I recognize the car industry research team. Uh, Shashank Modi, Amek and Raghu, and Eric Paul Dennis have been leaders in this project and absolutely fantastic to work with. They, they've done some great work, continue to do great work. Um, I know all of the uh, partners appreciate the hard work that Mike, Emeka, and Eric have done. And it's been important to this to this whole project to have, have a team that, that is willing to talk, to push, and, and even nudge back at folks when, when there's something that doesn't seem right because it's it's been a it's been a long process. And I think part of the value of that process has been the team that we've had, both internal at CAR and with that that ecosystem we described. As I've described before, we've been looking <clears throat> mostly at the manufacturing portion of Industry X, or maybe so, some have said even manufacturing X. But we also have realized, and Mike and Brian again today, another point today, is the data is flowing so much further and so much faster than it ever has. And when we tried to do this project and keep it within the walls of that manufacturing facility, at least to begin with, quickly it moved outside of those walls and that i think is is something that we want to talk about is is how we look at this both from a manufacturing perspective but that much bigger data continuum as we started this project also we, we looked at four building blocks and for those that have been 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 along for this ride in the webinar series over the last several um weeks you may have realized or it struck you that i, I have struggled to try to articulate where these building blocks are and how they fit together. Back, remember, when we had the um, the people webinar, I made sure that the people building block was right in the middle of it because of my background as someone that is so used to the uh, labor education and that training. Um, <clears throat> but it's really important. These are, we think, four critical parts to this process. The technology, the strategy, the people, and the process. But as we've gone through the process, and it's been a great traveling road to travel down, um, we maybe shifted how we want to look at this a little bit. <clears throat> we think they're obviously the same building blocks, but
but maybe look at it as a little bit different design, sort of a Venn diagram, sort of just a, a little bit different thought process. But around it all, you had this strategy. And driven from that strategy is the implementation, the process implementation. But that process implementation is two different parts. One is very much the people part of it, and the other is the technology part. While those two are absolutely related and can't have one without the other, um, sorry, you can't have one without the other. It's it's very important that you think about both of those. You can't do this without the people, and you can't do this without the technology processes. So the Car Industry X project, as I've said before, we had multiple inputs on this long pathway. We've done long form interviews with vehicle manufacturers and suppliers. We've done industry roundtables, and Brian was, was so helpful to, to help lead that and, and, and really be kind of an impetus for getting those done well. And we've also done a brief technology survey, not, not, a, not a large survey, but just a brief survey to kind of follow up and check on some of the um, some of the things we learned, but, but focusing more on the technology and the processes. So we did this as researchers, and we did this independently as researchers, but we also realized that possibly the most important part of this was the strength of working with the tech industry. This group of companies, this group of um, partners in this project, this ecosystem allowed us to take what we had learned from the car companies, take what we understood, and then talk to them about it and not necessarily listen to what they said about how to change it but listen to what they said about why things might be different and how we should consider it and so as we looked at all of these inputs we think we came up with a really good project that i hope i think we'll have a good report coming out shortly and i'll talk about that in a moment but i think it also started to help or continued to help create these partnerships and these relationships and and whether this is the perfect ecosystem or not, certainly not, not a question, but, but really identified that need for that ecosystem to grow. As we did these interviews with the car companies and then worked with the tech companies on and kind of thinking about that, the tech team or the research team that I showed you earlier, we started to think it's, it's really good stuff. We were really lucky to talk to the car industry and to the tech industry on this project. And in doing that, we thought, you know, it's worth taking that knowledge, what we've saw from the tech industry and doing a webinar series. So over the last month, we've done the webinar series and we had the people webinar um, back in, in mid November. Last week, we did the technology webinar and today we're gonna close it up with a strategy and process webinar. And I think it's been a really good opportunity for us kind of to share one unique insight that we've gotten into this project from the tech world. Um, you can also go back and look at those previous two webinars and recordings. <clears throat> so with that, it's perfect timing, Mike. We'll have you go first, but it's perfect timing because as usual, my voice is about to give out. So why don't, Mike, we have about five, 10 minutes of, of opening thoughts and comments from yourself on this big picture strategy process thing. And then Brian, we'll, we'll go to you. Okay, great. Guys, can you see, um, hold on one second, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Perfect. That's always, that's always a good start. Um, one second here. Okay, great. Um, and I apologize for the halo over my head, but it is nighttime still here in San Francisco, <laughs> so I unfortunately have to have an overlight head um, over me today. So I'm so sorry about that. I was not too distracting. All right, so guys, let's uh, just a few things I want to just talk about. You know, today we're going to be talking about data, you know, uh, uh, about processes of, uh, around Industry 4.0. Uh, those processes are leading to digital transformation. Fundamental to the changing of these processes is a data analytics lifecycle. I just want to kind of, I just want to define that in a way that we that we typically do here at Cloudera, just to start off the conversation. Then I also want to just talk about some use cases in terms of, okay, so now we've got this data analytics lifecycle. What are people actually trying to do with this data analytics lifecycle? I want to just kind of throw that out so that I think uh, we, we set a little bit of foundation for the, for the later conversations. So when we talk about a industry 4.0, uh, 
um, um, analytics life cycle. What do we actually mean? What are we actually trying to achieve here, right? And I'll give you an example here. This is like, say, if we're trying to do an equipment predictive maintenance use case. Um, first of all, you know, it all starts at the plants, right? You've got to connect to data in the plants, right? This is a huge challenge, and it could be, the challenge can be one plant or it could be multiple plants as you, as you roll out these implementations. But at the end of the day, you've got to connect to all kinds of data in the plant. It could be that operational technology data. When we say that, we mean this sensor data, right? This is like data from the sensors. It tends to be its time series data, right? Some plants also have IT data centers within the plant, right? So you might have to connect to data from the MES systems, plant-specific ERPs. Increasingly, you have to connect to new data sources that you see over here as well, so images and things like that, because if you're doing computer vision quality inspections, right, you're using now computers and cameras to do your quality inspection, well, guess what? You have to collect that information initially so that you can train your machine learning models. We'll talk more about that in a second, though. But at the end of the day, you need to collect all this data, right, from the plant. You need to be able to collect it. You might want to make... Um, do real-time decisioning. You might want to do streaming analytics at the edge, right? So you might, so right in the plant, you might want to do streaming analytics. But I want to show you that these these streaming analytics, these actions that you can take through machine learning, are actually the product of an analytics lifecycle. And that's what I'm going to walk you through right now. So we collected data. Yes, you might have to take actions at the edge, but how did you actually get to the point where you made those those actions intelligent? Well, what you did is typically is you now push that data that you've collected to to the cloud or to your or, or, or to your data center, right? So now you've collected, for example, sensor data, right? You might want to enrich that data with data from your enterprise, say from your ERP system or your maintenance management system. Now you've kind of collected data, a broad data set. You might be able to, you know, now you're set up to answer questions like which sensor values from the plant correlated to the need for machine maintenance from your machine uh, maintenance system, right, your enterprise systems. You start to see that you've got these complete sets of data. Now, what do you try to do once you've got all this data in your enterprise data, like you're tending to do, to do, uh, tending to do two different things. First of all, you want to provide BI, business intelligence, to your enterprise, so people can query data, can look back on data, find the data that they need, but more importantly, I think that one of the key cornerstones of Industry 4.0 is once you've collected these long histories of data, like I said, all those sensor data, all that sensor data from your sensors, all your maintenance repair orders from your uh, maintenance management system, right, an enterprise system, you know, you now have the data sets uh, available to create machine learning models. So you start to say, what were the sensor values that correlated to the need for maintenance in the future, right? And you build out these machine learning models, but it doesn't end there. That now you take that machine learning model and you deploy it back out to the edge, and that's how you could start making those intelligent actions. Because then as that data came in, you're running it against that model and say, okay, these sensor values now are in that range that was identified in my machine learning model. Say, Oops, we're going, to, we're going to give you advanced warning. This real-time action that you need to schedule maintenance in the future, and you need to order your spare parts for supply chain readiness. Right. So this is what we mean by a, um, a you know, you know, a, a, a you know, a manufacturing machine learning or analytics lifecycle. Right. You have to be able. It all starts with collecting data, storing it, contextualizing, bringing in additional data doing machine learning and then and then deploying the results of those machine learning models back out to the edge so that you can take real-time actions. And this is foundational for a whole set of use cases ranging from, and this is what I wanted to talk about, and we're going in order of increasing complexity. Simple, just you know, once we've connected things up, just being able to monitor my equipment. This is like the simplest thing. Is my, or is my equipment staying within the control plan, right? Staying within the bounds of the control plan. Um, are we still conforming to those processes? Just real simple visibility. By the way, really important in the days of COVID, right? Where you might not necessarily be able to have folks down at the plant being able to do some 
we can do this now remotely, which is really interesting. But you know, once you start, and that's the simplest use case, you're looking at individual sensors, are they within that control plan? But at some point, you want to be able to bring all those data source, you know, either more sensors or bring that sensor data together with that enterprise transaction data that I was talking about. You start doing something called Process 360. That is the formation of your, your, your data lake, right? Um, we're not going to still know machine learning here. We're just bringing together data sources. Then what do you do? You have use cases like quality event forensic analysis, which means I've got warranty claims in the field or defects in the field. Can I trace back to the manufacturing conditions of the day, those sensor values? And this isn't machine learning either. You're just connecting the dots, right? Hey, got failures. What was unique about those failures and finding the root cause? But then you get to a whole set of use cases that do, in fact, involve machine learning, where you actually have to collect data, long histories of data, build out those machine learning models, and then put those machine learning models to action in, in a real-time screen. And you know, things like computer vision quality inspection, right? Take pictures at the end of manufacturing steps. You know, uh, then record whether that manufacturing step was a good or a bad quality outcome. Use that data to train what we call classification models. And, hey, this type of picture was a good quality outcome. This one was a bad outcome. Train the machine. Now the machine can. Now, now the computer can do the inspections on its own. Like so, those are all machine learning uses. So I just wanted to throw this out here because when we talk about use cases. These are the types of things that we're trying to do. Hey, we, we're going to use this data for analytics use cases and machine learning use cases to do things like automate, to, to provide greater and greater levels of automation, to be able to, 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 to enable processes such as predictive maintenance. And these are the types of um, analytics and machine learning use cases that we see. So I just wanted to set this up, talk to you about what is a, a machine, you know, a analytics and machine learning lifecycle data lifecycle, we just went through that, <clears throat> and then this notion of use cases, right? And hopefully this will set the foundation for the uh, further conversation today. Very good, Mike. And, and as I said earlier, we did the people process a few weeks ago. This is, this is a perfect lead in, a perfect discussion of the technology process and those use cases. And, and that's the process part of today. Brian, there's also the strategy part of this. How about if you you tie it from the process to the strategy and, and, and take it from there? Love to, thank you. And uh, Mike, I always love listening to your presentation because I always learn something. So that's awesome. Thank you. All right, I am going to share my screen, I think. And I'm going to um, trust that, whoops. I'm going hey. to trust that you can see a, uh, so, Brian, a frame outline. Brian, could I interrupt for just a moment? I, I forgot an yes. important, um, function on my part, uh, I, I need to remind folks that if you want to submit questions, do that through the question um, function on your tool, uh, on, on the uh, toolbox, on the toolbar. So all questions can be submitted. I will get them and we'll go from there on. I apologize, Brian. Sometimes you got to take care of business first though. That's all right. So you can see my screen, I'm guessing. Perfect. Yeah. Ask, excellent. Okay. So, um, Brent, when you when you kicked off, you said a couple of things that um, that I thought were particularly interesting, poignant, if you will. And you talked about mm -hmm. data flowing further and faster than than ever before, and you talked about a, a data continuum. So I, I want to pick up on those themes. And then Mike, I mean, you, you and I didn't rehearse together, but a <laughs> lot of the not surprising, a lot of the themes that you talked about. Um, and, and, and capturing data from one end and using it in the other, I, I think it's spot on. And, and I think that's core to an effective strategy in this space. So I'm going to, I'm going to what I'd like, like to do right now is to talk a little bit about what we consider some of the building blocks and then maybe share a vision as to what, uh, what it can look like at end state. And, and then to be, hopefully to be helpful, Talk about some of the roadblocks that we see organizations that ha have to navigate through or around to get there. So, so with that, um, again, on the building block. So, so Mike talked a lot about, uh, about the how to connect and, and, and everything like that um, and the different challenges. I, I mean, I'm going to start with a little bit around the why 
And if you think about the concept of, of data that Brett kicked off with, I mean, it almost seems trite now because we've heard it so much, mm-hmm. but we hear that data, data is the new oil and, and coming living in Texas, uh, we can relate to that a lot. But the, uh, the, the, the principle of what we're talking about here is, is using data to affect business decisions in a better way, using data to drive increased economics for, for an organization. And, and, and our experience is that every organization is dabbling in this area. I mean, I don't know anyone who does not have some form of a proof of concept, proof of value going on in the area of, of predictive maintenance. And, and there, of course, the focus is entirely around minimizing downtime, maximizing uptime, and reducing repair severity along the way. I, I think that um, this year, more than ever before, this, this principle are around connected worker has been on the top of everyone's um, agenda. I remember back when uh, all of the OEMs plants were down, all of the conversations that were taking place then around worker tracking and connect worker. And I mean, at the time we had conversations around all of the OEMs were going to equip all of their assembly team members with with either a some form of a, a wireless device, a phone, a watch, or a, a patch, a badge uh, to 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 monitor tracking, and it didn't go that way. Okay, and and, and in retrospect, it was probably the, the right way, but we're we're seeing new uses of data to enhance the the efficiency, the capability, the output every day. And, and it's it's in some of the basics, predictive maintenance is I'm going to tell you one of the basics, um, but there's some of the other interesting ones too. I, I mean, all of the work that's taking place in the around energy management in our plants. Um, I, I mean, my personal experience there is is that organizations who use the energy data management capabilities that are out there are able to drive high single digit in, in in efficiency improvements. And I'll tell you, having having spent a long time in the industry, that really shocked me until I saw it repeat itself over and over and over again. Um, the other the other thing that I think that is has been new and advanced, and I would tell you we're still on the thin edge of the wedge, is this area around here about uh, 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 artificial intelligence, more importantly, machine learning, in, in how those advanced tools are helping drive efficiencies across the, the manufacturing spectrum. Now, I guess the, the other piece to keep in mind, and, and it's not trite at all, is this element at the top here around data or cybersecurity. And um, there has just been way too many examples over the last 12, 18 months in our industry where ne'er do wellers have uh, decided that that's, uh, that uh, they want to test our limits and test our capabilities. So all of this is great. These building blocks are absolutely necessary. Don't forget the element around data security. So when you put together these building blocks in an appropriate fashion, what can you hope for? Well, our belief, our vision, is our is what we call the intelligent operations vision and and this talks to a lot of the points that brett uh, referenced it talks a lot of the points that 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 mike referenced which is bringing multiple solutions multiple data across the entire uh, across the entire enterprise and here the enterprise includes the ecosystem so the way i always talk about it is that you've got in theory you've got the oem at the center You've got the customer, we've got dealers and customers on the one end over here, and you've got manufacturing, suppliers, everything else over here, just uh, going backwards in the value chain. And this principle around developing a singular data platform is really designed to do what we have, what we struggle with today, and, and that is to seamlessly pass that data back and forth. Uh, Brett talked about it as a data continuum and this principle about 
data flowing further and faster than ever before. And yes, today we pull warranty claims data, or an OEM would pull warranty claims data, and 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 turn it around internally and selectively send it to suppliers, typically for chargebacks, sometimes for analysis. But what we're talking about here is is really trying to do it in a more proactive fashion, and and, and truly integrate elements around supplier quality, around manufacturing, around quality inspections in the plant, and the after sales or, or, or service incident rates. What we're talking about here really requires this principle around a controlled tower, a cadence, if you will, to move things back and forth. I, I mean, it's a fair point to say that organizations today are rich in data and starved for insight. And I think that um, that's a problem statement that we're going to see exacerbate itself as we start pulling more and more data off of our connected vehicles. And, and you, we've all heard the same statistics around an autonomous vehicle will churn out 40 terabytes of data a day. And my first reaction to that is, awesome, is always, wow, what are we expected to do with 40 terabytes of data coming off an entire fleet of vehicles? So, I mean, this is our end-to-end -end vision, our, our, our intelligent operation slash control tower vision as to where the industry is going to go. Now, the challenge that we face is that not every organization is set up to get there today. And um, so the, a common question for that, that we're presented with is, how do I know when I'm ready? How do I know that I've got the building blocks in place to really make this happen. And, and um, what we'll often suggest is an organization, an organization engage in some form of a self-assessment. Here we've, and I, I, I've captured one that we've worked with, uh, with the end companies with, and, and we call it our, our digital maturity assessment. And it really looks across seven different dimensions everything from operational technology, IT, so OT, IT, data, process, workforce, automation, security. A lot of the same things that the, that the car research that Brett has been talking about. And then within each of these seven dimensions, if you will, we've got, I'll call them stages of excellence or stages of maturity. And, and what we've done over time is, is develop a, a point of view of where our industry, automotive, is around each of these seven dimensions. And then in this particular case, I've shared with uh, hiding the individual, of course, but shared where our particular client was along these different dimensions. And the idea is that we'd use this information to to to, uh, to force a discussion around where additional investments are needed or necessary. I mean, if I think about in this particular case, this particular client was far and away ahead of our industry in terms of security. But there were other areas in terms of IT where the client was behind the industry. And this helps set a, a prioritization of where investment, where improvement was really, really necessary. And, and again, um, I think the other key point around here is that uh, on the right, I tried to capture some of the challenges that we see in many automotive companies, be them OEMs or the tier supply community. And, and you know, I don't know if any or many of these will resonate with you, but I'm going to, I'm going to guess that there are a couple here. Um, I, the fact that there's not a singular data strategy and you're getting strategies out of the IT organization, you're getting strategies out of the operations organization. Um, this concept of my, my, uh, my supply base is fragmented and who do I trust in this space? Um, the, the other area, of course, is, is down here where I, I get it, Brian, this is exactly what we want to do. But when I look at my business case and I stack it up against the business case around the core or traditional business, I lose out nine times out of 10. So, so these are the kinds of issues that I think that, that are challenges that, that need to be addressed. 
And again, as they always say, the first step to solve a problem is to identify the problem. The last thing I wanna, I wanna highlight is um, how you go about getting it done. And I mean, I, I, I try to always end on, on, on something that you can take away with. And, and I think this is it. As you're thinking about this migration, as you're thinking about this intelligent operating system fueled by data, if, if the intelligent operating system is, is the end state and, and data is, is the juice, the energy that makes it work, then, then again, how do you make it work? And it's always the same story here, right? It, it's um, bring in the right team, think about the problem in a way that will have a meaningful impact on the business, and then start with a piece of it um, because you're not gonna be able to tackle it, the whole thing all at once. And, and I think our, our maturity assessments that we've used across the industry have really identified that. And then once you get on board with it, once you start to make it work, scale it scale it fast so i'll end on that um and uh and i guess uh brett turn it back to you yep <clears throat> and sarah should help get you out of that so so mike and and brian as i was watching both of you i thought so this is what what 60 plus years of combined knowledge of industry x and automotive looks like really good really good stuff um as you point out, Brian, watching you and Mike, you learn a lot every time. Every time I talk to you, I learn the difference, Brian, I think, between BMW and Cannondale. Isn't that the, the connection? Something like that, yes. So <clears throat> there are a bunch of questions that I have coming in and some, some that we had lined up. I want to go back to, Brian, one of your last slides, or, or maybe part of that. Um, as we did these interviews, companies who were very good at this, and early in the process, but but good. A lot of them almost apologized for for not being further along in this process. And Mike, as you'd go with these companies, you can follow up with this as well. But Brian, should they be apologizing for being laggards or not even laggards, but in the pro in the beginning stages? No, not not at all. I mean, so so here's the thing: we did some research. Well, it's probably it's over a year ago now because it was before the world stopped with uh, with the, <laughs> the pandemic. Um, but what we found was this: I mean, we, we looked at this space and, and we we did a survey. Um, well, actually, we did a survey across multiple industries and then we broke it down by industry. But in our industry, that and I'm going to get this roughly right, um, but something around it was either 78 or 82 percent of the executives in automotive acknowledge that what you're talking about, the industry four, the industry X perspective was absolutely core and critical to success going forward. And then we then we double clicked into that and we said, okay, so where are you on the journey? And, 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 and without going through all the multiple steps, at the time, 7% of organizations believed that they were where they needed to be and they were they were following the right vision. They had the North Star and they were following that North Star. Seven percent. So, I mean, that means yeah. the other 93 percent were, were in the situation that I think you heard a lot of in in the um, in the interviews, right? So, so Mike, you're in, you're in that in the in the weeds sometimes in, in getting those processes in. You have to talk to the folks in the plant and and those that are running the plants and, and have the bigger picture on that part. But how do they feel about being ready, being capable and, and being competitive? You know, when I when I look at this space, and I think Brian said, said it exactly right, this, first of all, this is a journey, right? So I, I, and I'm looking at, you know, when I, when I reflect back on what I've, what I've seen is it's kind of two broad barometers of quote unquote success. And, they, and you know, companies can be in what I'm going to call the experimental stage, right? They're doing experiments in these areas, right? Sometimes, you know, culminating and maybe doing a pilot in one plant, that's one thing, you know, that requires one, you know, one set of, of, of challenges. Do, doing small experimental things, the critical things there is that you get buying from the business so that you can do. But then there's a whole nother topic in terms of once you've got a few of these experiments up and running, how do you scale this out to the enterprise? Yeah. 
And that has a whole slew of other challenges, things like security and governance that Brian said, you kind of really take all those things into consideration because now we're, now we're talking big time, we're trying to roll this out over our organization. We want to make sure that we're not creating chaos at scale. So, you know, when, when I, I, I look at the plan, going to, back to your point, it's about um, uh, starting in the plant, starting small with experiments, making sure you have executive that get the business level buy-in on that and showing success. That's Mike, the piece. Yeah. Mike, a perfect lead in to a question that, that I want to hit on. And as we went through these these interviews and the surveys and such, um, we found a company would focus on a technology. They'd get a technology, but they'd get lost in the complexity of it. Companies may start with the right motive. They start with that POC, they start proof of concept, they start with, but they it gets complicated quickly. Um, when this happens, sometimes the business case is lost and all of a sudden, it looks like you failed when you really are just in the learning process. Uh, Mike, couple. What are the most common technology implementa implementations you're seeing now that are successful, and um, what are some of the stumbling blocks that you see, Mike? So you know, right now, most of the technology implementations I'm seeing, you know, it's, ba it's basic blocking and tackling. It's getting your machines hooked up. It's doing remote performance <clears throat> monitoring. Mm -hmm. It's dabbling then into small pilots around things like machine learning use cases, like predictive maintenance. And where they've been successful is when you have two ingredients. You aligned with the business to say, hey, this is what here, here are going to be the metrics for success. So it's agreed upon what is a successful outcome. And the other ingredient is that it's scope sufficiently small. Because if you try to boil the ocean, to your point, you inevitably will get a whole slew of obstacles because these are new technologies. You have to get people trained up. There's, yeah. a, you know, skill sets have to grow. There's a lot of moving parts here and a lot of opportunities for failure. So, define success with the business. What defines success? And keep that scope manageable. Brian, how, how do you simplify? How do you simplify it? Well, I mean, so I, I love this conversation because I think this is where organizations fail all the time. We're not going to say fail, struggle. And, and Mike, um, I'm not going to repeat what you said, but I'm totally aligned with it. I'm going to add a couple things to it. And, and that is where, where we sometimes see challenges, and, and then as, so your point, Brett, is what the answer is, is where organizations start with the technology as compared mm -hmm. to starting with a business problem. So I'll give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. Someone gets all excited, reads an article, goes to a conference, comes back and says, I want to do a digital twin or a digital thread and, and embarks on a, a lofty mission with that in mind without necessarily thinking about why am I doing it or, or what's the business case associated with doing it? And, and, I, and I think that is absolutely critical. Start with the business problem. I think the other piece to, to add to, to what, uh, what Mike was talking about is that you're going to hit roadblocks along the way. There's going to be speed bumps. And the way to make this successful is make sure you bring in the leadership as necessary at the start of the project, not at the speed bump. So it's, it's you know, I always say bring in the senior leaders first. Start with start with the business problem, not with the technology. Um, and then uh, exactly what Mike said, we call it, we'll sometimes call it a thin slice, okay? So rather than try to eat the elephant, find a chunk that you can carve off that's strategically aligned with your end state and then run that. The thin slice is going to help your business case because this is going to struggle against the investment requirements from the rest of the business and then declare victory and then, and then scale it up from there. Yeah, the, the discussions we had through this project on that internal rate of return and if you measure these similar to another project or another another opportunity, it's a really challenging um, decision process for companies. Yeah, um, and, and if I just on that, if I can, um, so you know, one of the things we're seeing right now, and it it probably applies more to OEMs, I think, than OES. Although the, it'll work for the suppliers as well if. if if you're driving for an online presence, as some of them are with a sell direct model, 
But um, th this principle around how do I compete with the digitally native companies out there that don't have, I'll, I'll say, the legacy IT debt that they're having to fund today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mean, what we're seeing organizations do is is step away from some of the core metrics that uh, that uh, our our core or the old industry used to drive, and try to bring in some new metrics along the way that uh, that allows these investments to uh, to be higher in the priority scale. Very good. So, so guys. Um... You've heard this over and over. We heard it over and over and over again in this project. But data is driving everything. But sometimes, often, we have challenge in understanding what those opportunities are. Every participant that we spoke with, across the suppliers, manufacturers, and even the technology companies, was convinced that data was becoming, as one person said, as valuable as the product. Two topics to think about, we'll, we'll let you think about. Find, finding the value of data within the walls of the factory. Let's talk about that for a moment, but also then finding the value all along that data continuum. So, so Mike, how about starting with, how do you find the value of data within the, the factory and, and looking for that? Giving us stories, use cases, things that you can say, hey, here's where data really made that difference. And how do you communicate that? Yeah, you know, it, it gets back to what one of the things I was saying earlier. It's yeah. easy to fall into the trap that you think, you know, when you think of the, the, the promise of Industry 4.0, you think about fully intelligent robots and you think of fully fully automated uh, processes. And, well, that is the end goal. You know, where I've seen, and I think, Brian, you, I'm curious to get your opinion, you know, you're, some of the greatest value that is being achieved now is simple visibility. It's like remote performance monitoring, um, providing the ability to monitor the processes. You know, just remember, sensor prices have come down two thirds over the last decade and they're connected to the internet. So, so this type of visibility to data and to sensors and stuff like that is a new thing. So the companies who are early on, yeah, we want to get to full, full autonomy one day and we want to be able to do all those types of but simple things like can I monitor my processes, number one, and then starting to, you know, really pull down the low-hanging fruit in terms of things like, uh, you know, eliminating or reducing those mundane tasks or mm -hmm. the dangerous tasks from a, you know, and, and, and replacing that with the, those with automation. So I think that the point is to be surgical to decide what, it, where is the value, where can I get it the fastest, and mm -hmm. recognize that this is a, this is indeed a journey. Brian, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally align. I mean, when when Mike was talking, I, I couldn't help but think about a, a, a client I've been working with, and his his issue is, is that they don't have a uniform environment. So this is an organization that has roughly a hundred assembly plants or, or, or plants. And on the one end, they've got technology that is almost lights out, okay? And on the other end, they're kind of working on green screens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how do I drive the, this intelligent operating system model in an organization that has got such diversity in terms of its technology capabilities today. And, um, and, and one of the things, I mean, Mike, you talked about uh, pulling data and, and how sensory prices have come down. And that's, I mean, how helpful is that in, 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 in along this migration? I think what, one of the things we're seeing is, as well, and one of the areas that a number of our auto clients are operating partners are, are struggling with is, is that, we don't even have we don't even have good sensor data coming in in all parts of the plant because we haven't strung the connectivity and the cabling around there. I mean, yeah. something as simple as that. And 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 this is where every year it seems there's a breakthrough in technology that enables more and more and more of this to happen. All right, I am not the expert on 5G, but I will tell you, 5G is driving a tremendous opportunity in some of these older environments where going in and stringing cable doesn't make a ton of sense. 
So you, 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 you morph to a 5G environment and that connectivity problem goes away. Yeah, and just, and just one other point too, you know, when we're talking about the analytics, kind of what's interesting is, you know, in the old days, not few, and we're talking about the old days just a few years ago, if you wanted to do one of these use cases, you have to buy the, you know, the analytics use case, you have to buy hardware, you have to buy software, you have to, you know, so enter the cloud, right? Enter more self-service types of software applications for analytics and machine learning, right? So all of this is getting easier. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we are still early on in this. Oh gosh! And that's what makes this this the space so exciting. Um, we've come a long way from a core technology standpoint, from an implementation standpoint. But you know, it take it, you know, as this I think the series has shown, it takes a lot to ultimately get there. And I think that's what makes this journey so interesting. Yeah, there is there is this is such and we'll get to that in a moment. Such a complex, such a big, such a rapidly moving topic that it's just it's just amazing um hey brian for just a moment or two <clears throat> excuse me how about looking outside the walls looking up and down the value stream and what accenture and in, in, in your position in accenture you see are are is happening there and how companies are are moving so there's there's a couple of things that's going on right now i mean the um and you mentioned it earlier around this, the importance of the, well, you, you called it around uh, the data continuum. We see a lot of work with, I'll say, ecosystem partners becoming more and more valuable to uh, to the process. Uh, and, and those are those are established players, but there's there, there are startups that are contributing really, really positively in the in the environment today. One of the one of the uh, the I'll say challenges of a CDO a CIO it, it is to make sure that they're always scanning the horizon to uh, for, for the for the for the next thing that will help fuel the business. I mean to that end, um, and I'm sure that many of your 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 members would appreciate this, but uh, CES is virtual next year in January. Mm -hmm. um, so and the bad news is that you won't be able to go to Vegas. The good news is that you'll be able to tap in to a lot of the insight from the from the comfort of your uh, of your living room as as you maybe are today. Um, I found I have found over the last three, four, five years that uh, CES has become an imp um, an increasingly important venue for our industry. I learn yeah. something new every time I go there, and I would encourage those uh, to, to to take a look at it. Let me let me a, a couple of quick hitters here. No, they, they probably can't be quick hitters, but we have to have them. We've talked a little bit, Mike and Brian, about the, the challenges of return on investment and measuring it versus others. Brian, what are some of the the new metrics when you look at industry X and try to figure out if it's working? And Mike, do you think about that for a moment? Can can answer after Brian. So quality is always one. Uh, I mean. And again, depending on on where you are in in the continuum, I mean, so so uh, focus focusing on throughput, th focusing on quality, those are relatively old metrics. Right. Uh, and anything around anything be, because of the the evolution of customer uh, expectations, everything around uh, CSAT, customer SAT, um, is, is playing a much more important role than I think it used to in manufacturing equations. Um, and, and then um, in the listen, we we all know that um, the revenue and profitability of the spares business is under threat, under attack because of the migration of the industry. You, those of you in the crash parts business have already experienced that. Those of you who are selling uh, maintenance parts for ice are are going to experience that. Mm -hmm. So. so so uh, technology enablement that can help fortify those sectors of the business are becoming more and more important. So, so real quick, Mike, so, so just, just to make sure you jotted this down, this is why he's the automotive lead at, at Accenture. He could take a tough question and wrap it up succinctly, thoughtfully, and co correctly, right? And Mike gave you time to think about it. Real quick, your thoughts on those new metrics. So. You know, building on Brian's excellent foundation there. Um, two things I, you know, I think the one thing is around agility, and what we're talking about, what I'm talking about there is around demand-driven manufacturing, right? Because and 
this industry's always kind of wanted to get to like build to order. Industry 4.0 kind of starts getting you there in that look. Not only are we censoring up our plants, we've got a real public, we essentially censored up the consumers. Well, right, we're monitoring click streams, we're monitoring what they do, you say, on social media. So anything we can do to better understand demand and, and, and use machine learning and, and intelligence around that to better predict, move, move more and more towards understanding that demand and being able to build to that order is a goal the industry's always tried to move. I think that's kind of one future state. The other thing that I think is, is really important in this industry, and it gets a little out of the plank, but is this whole notion of service, not just parts, it's transportation as a service, and how that's gonna change the whole paradigm of, 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 uh, of the industry. And I think the metrics around there are just simple in terms of are you gonna survive and, and as a, as a in, the, in this new, from a business model perspective in this new world, so just. Great, great answers, guys. So one, Brian, one real quick one, a thought for you. I didn't see, and it was, I, I didn't look completely at it, but I didn't see sustainability as a measure or as a part of yours. That has become, certainly in Europe and other parts Absolutely. of the world, and soon to be in this country, a really, really kind of big thing. How does it, this come it, it, it absolutely, it is a huge thing. And um, I mean, I mean, Brett, that's a, that's a great pickup. It, if it's not on our foundational elements, it will be the next time you see the page. Um, <laughs> but it, but it, it, is, it is absolutely core. Um, the circular car, I think, is a, is a topic that many of you have started to, to read about, to hear about. It's an, it's an area that, uh, that we've been doing a lot of focus in, in. But as you said, it's in Europe and it's not over in North America yet. Mike, any thoughts quick on it? Are you good? I'm good. Good. So, guys, I knew this. Brett, would if happen. I could, if I could, one thing when you and I hadn't seen your new framework when you started off this yeah. the, today earlier on. I love it. Okay, and and in, in the at the center of it, you had technology and you had people, and I think that's really really interesting. And to be helpful, um, I I will share. That there is a there was a book that came out about a year ago, 18 months ago, and it's called Human and Machine, and it's written by one of my colleagues. Not an automotive book, but a book that's broadly about manufacturing. Guy's name is Paul Doherty, and it's written by Paul and Jim Wilson. Human and Machine. Um, I, I've given it to a number of my clients because I think it talks to a lot of the framework and the elements that you're thinking about. So to be helpful. Very good. We'll look forward to it. Um, I knew this would happen. I, I was thinking maybe we should make this an hour and a half, but they wouldn't let me. Um, we can just continue after the webinar and we can have this conversation. It's great. I want to wrap up with a couple of things. One, it's a really, it's, we've got about seven minutes left. So um, this, I think for Eric, Ameka, Shashank and myself has been, as we've gone through this process, the, the thing that struck us the most, and, and Industry X is really big. It is really complex and it is rapidly evolving. We kind of touched on earlier. It's seemingly impossible for any one person or any one organization to understand this. I mean, to even have a clue as to the, it's the old elephant example. Um, as researchers, we started this process looking at it as an ecosystem. I think that was driven by, by some Mike and others and, and that understanding that yes, it is really big. We, I think, confirmed that but I think what we really confirmed that it's an even bigger challenge than, than we thought going in. Um, the re research findings underscore the need for a collaborative, sustainable, and trusting ecosystem. So Mike, how about you? How, about, sir, how does such an ecosystem best build? You know, uh, how it's best built, I, that's really interesting. I mean, it's, it, it's funny. Uh, what if, my early objectives of this study was to, through this process, build out, uh, you know, um, move in the right direction in terms of building out these ecosystems. So Cloudera, for example, we've got a huge partner organization. We recognize that, you know what, it takes a village in terms of complex um, technology implementations. Industry 4.0, is amongst the most complex ecosystems mm -hmm. I can imagine in terms of when you look at as, as, as you look at the stack of hardware, software, domain expertise and consulting and all those kinds of things, hey, it 
it, 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 it takes a village. And so, so how do you do it? You do it by having partner organizations. You have to be committed to partnership. But it, but it's the hard work every single day in terms of doing efforts like this. And you know, and as as companies are implementing these technologies in the field, those relationships, the, those partner relationships, get stronger and stronger as you make things more repeatable. But um, you know, I, 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 I'm just going to close and saying, hey, the, the partnerships are essential in this space, and they take a lot of work. And, and uh, you know, organizations that recognize that and push towards that are the ones who are going to real quick that resistance going to win. Real quick from my point, Brian, before we jump two things. One, Mike, yeah, we've talked about, and every time I've done a webinar, we've talked about that ecosystem that we have for this research project. We as researchers don't know if that's the right ecosystem or the best ecosystem, but we have certainly found out that something has to be, it has to be inclusive and, and like that. It's a good start to talk about those things. I think next steps are, how do you really define that? There are so many variations on that. Brian, you have about two minutes to talk about what some of the key characteristics are maybe and and your thoughts on on that ecosystem so i i'll start with my, with the final word which is that our point of view is that technology isn't static your needs aren't static so your ecosystem shouldn't be static either so it's the principle that it's great you should always be scanning the horizon as i said earlier around what your needs are and where the industry is going how is technology coming in 24 months ago, you would have not had a 5G provider as part of your ecosystem in your manufacturing organization. Tomorrow, you need one. Yeah. So I, I think really succinctly, um, continue to scan the waterfront and make sure that you're you're flexing that muscle and you're bringing in ecosystem partners as, as the needs arise. So gentlemen, it's been really great. It's, it's always good talking with both of you. Both of you have so much experience, so much knowledge. It makes it a lot of fun for me. I want to close out with a couple of things. Um, first, the, the project that we've been talking so much about, that will be going to the funders by the end of a week from today, or I don't get a Christmas, so it'll be there. Um, and then we'll be releasing it, uh, putting it up on our web, and the others can release it the first, uh, I think the 4th of January. The other is, there are next steps here. And Mike, I know that, that Cloudera and others have been talking about uh, an event, and, and not a webinar, but an event, I've been told, um, on Industry X Made Real Insights and Solutions for Industry X. Um, and, and on the 4th of February, we'll, we'll get back to people with some of that information and, and others. Um, and, and as I say that, it's Microsoft, Cloudera, Intel, and some other partners. I feel like um, Jake Blues and the Blues Brothers looking at Elwood and saying, Elwood, the band, let's get the band back together. Um, and with that, it is about one minute to go. So I want to get skewed each of you with it, 30 seconds or less. What's the big challenge and the big opportunity for Industry X in the next five, three to five years? Mike, let's start with you. Big challenge, big opportunity. Yeah, I think, you know, just kind of consistent with what we've been saying, I think the big challenge is, is, is aligning all of the pieces, right? In terms of, and aligning the pieces starts with aligning your own organization you know, having a digital transformation strategy um, and having that trickle down to prioritize use cases and make sure that the people have the tools they need to succeed. And the other other piece of alignment is then that alignment of that ecosystem. And by the way, to the extent that the ecosystem can make it easier by working together and, yeah. and proposing ecosystem types of solutions to the to customers, that's a good a good thing as well. So anyway, Brian, uh, the uh, I, I think the uh, the economic return is easily in the double digits. It's uh, it's something that every organization is going to have to do. It's a question of how fast you can get there. Uh, there are some of the some of the basics. You got to be on the cloud. You've got to do you've got to do all of the other things right, uh, and then you also have to have that north star, or you'll lose your way. Hey, gentlemen, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you both so much for your time. We'll talk soon. It's a pleasure. Bye, Happy holidays. Thank you for attending. Have a good weekend. Bye.